Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday. Now before we begin, if you're new to our channel, these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, something regarding diet, nutrition, Chinese medicine, herbalism, or really anything related to health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity, the questions that we feel be most beneficial to the community as a whole, and of course the questions that we are capable of answering. And something else really great about these videos is that every week from that comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. So even if you don't have a health question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs, all you have to do to be entered to win is simply give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, and then just drop any old comment in the comment section below. And with all that being said, let's get to this week's questions. All right, so our first question comes from Ryan and it reads, you give great advice. My question is, are there any herbs or lifestyle changes to deal with hyperhidrosis? So for those of you that do not know, this term hyperhidrosis refers to excessive sweating. And there are actually simple, well-known causes of this and very simple things that you can do. Yes, there are herbs and other dietary and lifestyle factors that you can address to help correct the issue. But before we get into the causes and cures, let's very quickly talk about the difference between normal sweating and excessive sweating. Now I say this because I talk about all the time in these videos how it's generally good to have a high metabolic rate and a higher basal body temperature, around 98.6 or 7 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty warm. You generally want to feel warmer than you do colder. And this is simply because having a generally higher body temperature is indicative of this higher metabolic rate more efficient blood circulation, energy production, etc. So if you become too cold, obviously you're going to start to feel less and less energetic. Think of winter time when you have low energy, low circulation, you don't really want to do anything. So being too cold can be a major issue, especially for most people. But also keep in mind that temperature is about a balance. So you also don't want to get too hot either. But what's interesting about excessive sweating in my research and personal experience is that although you would think that excessive sweating is the byproduct of having too high of a metabolic rate, meaning your body temperature is too high and that's why you're sweating all the time, it's usually more so the opposite. That in the case of excessive sweating, the body temperature of the person, the metabolic rate chronically is lower, yet they're sweating profusely. So there are, of course, incidences where, you know, you have a very high metabolic rate and if you're in hot, warm climate or weather that you're going to sweat a lot. You know, I have a generally high metabolic rate. I'm usually consistently around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I have a pretty high resting pulse rate around like 88 beats per minute. I'm generally warm. My hands and feet are always warm. And right now it's pretty warm outside and I have a nice little layer of sweat over pretty much my whole body right now. But the thing that I've noticed in my personal experience, because I once dealt with excessive sweating in the past, was that although I was excessively sweating, I was still rather cold and tolerant. My hands and feet were kind of cold, and I never felt warm overall. Like I do right now, I feel pretty warm through and through, despite the temperature outside of me. My body's just, I can feel it radiating heat all the time, right? And in the past, when I had this excessive sweating, I was actually hypothyroid, which I later found out, but it was very obvious to see. My hands and feet were always cold, and I always felt generally kind of lower energy, more intolerant to cold, always wanting to you know, wrap myself up in blankets and you know, wear more and more layers. And I noticed that the sweating wasn't this like systemic sweat, like coming off of my face. I actually had a difficult time sweating during exercise. I didn't sweat generally throughout my body. I used to profusely sweat out of my armpits. So my armpits would sweat like crazy, but only my armpit. And this for me is more characteristic of excessive sweating. Now what's driving it is actually stress. The activation specifically of the cholerogenic system, the acetylcholine cholerogenic system, which stimulates the secretion of histamine, adrenaline, nitric oxide, and serotonin. And all these are actually stress substances. So what's tricky sometimes about diagnosing yourself and trying to figure out what's going on in your body is that a lot of the stress substances in your body and the activation of the stress system can cause effects that are very similar or almost overlapping to that of good metabolic function. So for example, adrenaline can get your heart rate pumping very fast, 
which is generally a good thing. You want to have a pretty high heart rate. You want it to be around 70 to 90 beats per minute, indicative of good metabolic function, strong circulation, strong energy production. However, driven by adrenaline, this is not necessarily going to be a good thing. This can cause a stress on the body because adrenaline starts to interfere with the proper functioning of the cells and energy production. Taking a look at nitric oxide. Nitric oxide can vasodilate, it can increase circulation, but again at the expense of mitochondrial energy production. And then things like serotonin can increase your body temperature, make you feel warm. This is why alcohol makes you feel warm while you're drinking it, but then you'll notice the next day your heart rate and your body temperature is actually lower because the estrogenic serotonin effects actually oppose the thyroid function and contribute to long-term uh, inhibition of energy production proper blood flow, circulation, it slows down the heart rate, lowers the body temperature, etc. So what I'm getting at is all of the stress substances in the body temporarily to help you cope with stress and survive can in a pseudo fashion increase all of the biomarkers of good metabolic function. And it's actually usually these things, it's high levels of acetylcholine and the activation of the cholerogenic system the high adrenaline, histamine, nitric oxide, and serotonin that usually attribute to the profuse sweating, which again is different than just sweating because you have a high metabolic rate and you're generally a warmer person. So if you're not yet sure whether or not you're just profusely sweating because it's a stress-driven condition, or if you're just profusely sweating or you sweat easily because your metabolic rate is high, which would be a good thing, you wouldn't necessarily want to change that, then I would suggest taking a look at a couple of things. In my experience, usually in profuse sweating, you're just profusely sweating a lot through the armpits. But if you were to check your body temperature on a consistent basis, you'd find that it's generally low. It's chronically lower than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You also might find that you have a low resting heart rate, that your hands and feet are cold, and that you generally have other symptoms of stress. Now keep in mind that there are studies that actually show that the overactivation of the acetylcholine cholerogenic system is actually largely caused by inescapable stress. So when researchers put mice in life or death situations where it's entirely unavoidable, there's nothing that they can do but pretty much succumb to the stress, that there's an overactivation, a shift from the metabolism, from the sympathetic state to this parasympathetic state where they're pretty much giving up biologically. And this activates, again, the acetylcholine, the histamine, the nitric oxide, and all these stress hormones in a more or less giving up fashion. So typically in just short bouts of stress, your sympathetic nervous system is going to get ramped up and this is going to give you this artificial energy to fight back or to flight. Remember, fight or flight is the response of the stress mechanism. You're either going to increase your heart rate and everything to fight that stress head on or you're going to run. But there's an interesting phenomenon where if somebody just gives up, they go into apathy, that there's an odd activation of the parasympathetic nervous system where they're not necessarily resting and chill out and they're just fine with it, but instead given up biologically and mentally that there's this very odd activation of all these stress hormones where the body is more or less shutting off in an attempt to escape the inescapable stress. So think of what a bear does in hibernation or a lot of animals. Winter, when you're living out in the mountains in Yellowstone and you're a bear and there's no food and it's negative 20 degrees and there's snow and you're starving, that's an inescapable stress for these bears. They can't hop on a plane and fly to Hawaii or something. So what do they do? They shut down, they hibernate. So there's an overactivation of the cholerogenic system and serotonin rises incredibly and all these things. And in a last resort attempt to survive and escape the inescapable stressors of winter, the bear goes into this hibernating state, which is sort of like an apathetic like state, at least biologically speaking. So my point is that this isn't an ideal state to be in. It's something that's driven by stress and inescapable stress at times. And it's at least a concept worth considering. So it's possible that if you're profusely sweating, that you feel like there's inescapable stress in your life, which is causing you to be chronically stressed to the point where you've shifted your metabolism to this chronic state of stress metabolism, which causes an elevation of all these substances. So that's one thing I always point out is, you know, take a look at the possible chronic stressor in your life. Is it a viewpoint? Is it a mental stress? Is it the way you see life? You know, do you look at your life and think, you know, there's something so bad about your life, but you feel like there's nothing you can do about it? That's a chronic stress, a psychological stress. But it could be other simple factors stimulating the secretion or production of all these stress hormones. So 
Generally speaking, anything that stresses you out physically, mentally, chemically, nutritionally will cause an increase in these substances, which is why it's so difficult to say exactly what the cure is because for everybody there's a different cause. But looking at possible inescapable stressors in your life, things that you feel like are problematic that you have no solution to, any sort of mental and emotional stress, but also very simple things that might be increasing adrenaline, nitric oxide, histamine, serotonin. These are the major things you're going to want to look out for and lower. But fortunately, we have videos on all of these substances, I'm pretty sure. So definitely reference the video that we've made on adrenaline, nitric oxide, serotonin, and histamine. So we have videos on all of these subjects with recommended herbs, dietary protocols, and lifestyle protocols for handling all these things. But in the fewest words possible, profuse sweating is just one of the many, many symptoms of a stress-induced hypometabolic state where your metabolism is working inefficiently, causing a dramatic increase of all these stress substances, which can overactivate the sweat glands, causing profuse sweating, which is not the same as just sweating from having a high body temperature. All right, so moving along, let's answer one more question today. This one reads, you have talked about fatty liver in a previous FAQ video. Can you explain what fatty liver is and how to reverse it? Many thanks. So the simplest way to understand what fatty liver is, is just as the name implies, the accumulation of fat in the liver. So the question is, why would this happen? Why would the liver start to accumulate fat of any sorts? Well, perhaps the most basic and systemic cause for this would be impaired metabolic function. So as this study points out and talks about, there's a pretty direct link between incidences of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and hypothyroidism. And the reason for this is actually very simple. If you understand anything about how your metabolism works, Basically, the metabolism is a massive system, over 10,000 different physiological functions, all with the major purpose and sole goal of producing energy in the body. So one of the basic ways we produce energy is, of course, through eating. So our food is a major source of energy, and any time that we consume a food, doesn't matter whether it's a fat, protein, or carbohydrate, that is ultimately broken down and can be turned into glucose to be oxidized and turned into ATP. Now, in the case that you're consuming more food than you are capable of metabolizing and breaking down, any excess energy will be stored as adipose tissue or fat. And there are a couple of reasons that this might occur. Very simply put, if you're eating more food than you need, any excess will be stored as fat. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be dangerous and harmful to your health. You know, think again of a bear. It gorges on food, it overeats all spring and summer long so it has a reserve of fat to survive during the winter but of course you know these animals don't have homes they can't travel the warm weather so for them gorging and increasing their fat stores is a helpful survival mechanism for when they go into lipolysis to live off that fat but that's a stressful condition and something i would consider to be an unideal stressful lifestyle overall so overeating in general chronically taking in more calories than you're capable of burning can lead to this issue. However, there are cases where somebody eats a normal amount or even less than normal amount and they still inefficiently metabolize their food and therefore store it as fat. And this is largely driven by hypothyroidism. The thyroid governs the rate of metabolism and it's responsible for both glucose and fat oxidation. So if your thyroid is low, no matter what you eat or how much you eat, you're likely to not properly metabolize that food, increasing the likelihood of it turning into adipose or fat tissue. So this is likely one of the major reasons why hypothyroidism is linked to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is because if your thyroid is low, that means your ability to turn food into energy is going to be inefficient and therefore that unmetabolized food or energy will be stored as fat and it might start to store in the liver. So these are a couple very simple explanations for it. But there are of course many things directly associated with an increased likelihood of fatty liver disease. Of course there's alcoholic fatty liver disease which is different than of course the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease but alcohol could contribute to the accumulation of fat in the liver just overall in many different ways so alcohol can be directly damaging to the liver because it impairs the liver's ability to produce atp and energy so anything that's actually going to damage the liver could increase the likelihood of 
fatty liver disease because if the liver is not producing ATP, if the cells become damaged, then the liver would become impaired, which would contribute to fatty liver disease in many different ways. First and foremost, if the liver is not functioning properly, it's not gonna be capable of solubilizing toxins and excreting them from the body. So the liver is responsible for solubilizing various toxins, various stress hormones like estrogens, and turning them into water to basically be excreted from the kidneys. So if the liver is not functioning properly, then all sorts of substances. Keep in mind that toxins have an affinity toward fat tissue. So if you're taking in any toxic substances, which we all are on a daily basis, but your liver is not capable of solubilizing them, they'll just store as fat in the liver and various places in the body. Same with estrogens. So high estrogen is going to store as fat tissue in the body, and if your liver is inefficient, then that means you're more likely to hold on to that estrogen and store it as fat somewhere in the body, likely the liver. But the liver, as I've talked about so many times, also activates 70% of the thyroid hormone into the active form. So if the liver is also becoming damaged by alcohol and various toxins, and even emotional stressors can damage your liver, then the thyroid is also gonna downregulate. This is gonna create a very vicious cycle, a nasty cycle, where the liver is inefficient at metabolizing toxins, so it's gonna store them, but it's also too inefficient to activate the thyroid, which means you're not gonna metabolize the food you eat as efficiently. And again, very nasty, vicious cycle you don't wanna be in. So getting back to the point, overeating, very basic cause of it, having a low functioning thyroid in general, so that way you're incapable of metabolizing the food you eat, and doing anything to damage the liver is gonna to contribute to fatty liver disease. And in addition to these things, I think dietary wise, a lot of people blame sugar, saturated fats, but I think in general, it's just the over accumulation. Eating too much of anything could contribute to this issue, just like eating too much of anything could contribute to obesity. But the real culprit, I think, are the polyunsaturated fats because they're basically anti-metabolic. They block the secretion and transport of thyroid hormone throughout the body, so they can't be metabolized. They're basically toxic to the human body. They're completely unnative. In many ways, they're not natural. You're never gonna find sunflower oil out in nature. If you had to go survive off of the land, you're not gonna find a canola plant. You're not gonna find copious amounts of nuts and seeds. It'd be very difficult and unnatural to consume the amount of polyunsaturated fats that we consume today. And again, in the simplest of terms, they're anti-metabolic. So they're not metabolized, which means that they're most likely going to directly store as fat or become adipose tissue soon as you consume them. And they're a major contributing factor to fatty liver disease through various mechanisms, through their general anti-metabolic effects, through their anti-thyroid effects, and through their toxic effects. So I would say that in regards to foods, the foods that are comprised of a large amount of polyunsaturated fats are probably going to be the worst foods for the liver and the largest contributors to fatty liver disease, more than sugar, even more than sucrose, more than any other food that you might eat. And one other last piece of information or another tip would be that both vitamin D and calcium actually inhibit fat formation, likely through their prothyroid effects. So they're increasing the function of the thyroid, which would prevent the accumulation or storage of fat in the body. But there are studies that show that increasing the intake of dietary calcium and vitamin D can actually be very therapeutic for correcting fatty liver disease. So getting adequate sunlight and eating super high quality dairy are two things to consider as well. All right, guys, so that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If you've enjoyed it and found it helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for future videos if you haven't yet already. And of course, if you're interested in winning some free herbs or medicinal mushrooms, remember all you have to do to be entered to win is hit that like button, subscribe, and then just drop a comment or question in the comment section below.